So, I, I mean, I don't want to draw on the past too much. Um, as I was coming into the cluster headache world, one of the, uh, one of the big challenges was the conceptualization of the disorder. Um, you probably know that it was conceptualized in the 80s and 90s. But if you understand, Simon's just thought it was weird. Um, and it was considered, I guess, weird until the 80s and 90s when they thought, when people thought it was a vessel, blood vessel uh, disorder, um, an inflammatory blood vessel disorder that just came and went. There was no real good explanation for it. It didn't make a lot of sense in, in any respect. So we, we became very interested in taking on the challenge and trying to understand which um, parts of the brain uh, were involved. Next slide. So it's 10 years now, uh, a little bit more than 10 years, since we started trying to uh, do the, the, the brain imaging work, which turned out, I think it turned out to be a reasonably important thing. Particularly the way my colleagues think about the disorder, there's something concrete about a picture with a yellow dot on it, uh, which, is, which is a bit strange because the, the, the picture of the person with it, with a with, with cluster uh, acute cluster headache is as is as stark for me as, as, as a picture of a yellow dot, but um, brain images have power in the modern world, and so 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 there it is. And and we imaged uh, patients, and um, it's one of the themes of the work that we've done over the last uh, more than ten years now, and the work I want to hope to continue to do. Um, in San Francisco, it, you can't advance the cause of this problem without involve, your involvement. So, uh, I mean, if, if you guys aren't involved, nothing's going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Um, and, and this sort of work happened because people wanted to be involved. You need a small group of willing people, and that will change change the way things are thought about. So, but this area in the back of the brain, the little, um, little block. Um, there is the thing which attracted everyone's attention because it's quite unique uh, in, the, in its position, quite unique for, uh, for, for cluster headache and in, its, in, in the way it sits in the brain with respect to the attacks actually entirely unique for cluster headache. There are some related conditions um, which you may know about respond to endomethacin which have, uh, which have activation patterns that are slightly different but in the same type of area um, in the brain. The other things that you see, um, they're markers of the, of the pain. I guess you don't need a validation of that. But that, that area is the anterior cingulate cortex. It's an area which is active if I, whether I um, poke you in the eye, you get a cluster attack, or someone pokes you in the backside. Um, you get quite literally actually people done rectal <laughs> distension um, pain, and you get um, uh, activation of the cingulate cortex. So that's not particularly, uh, particularly unique. Next slide. We were then quite um, surprised, I have to say. We went out to do something called voxel-based morphometry, and I, what more needs to be done with this? An interesting, and, and it'll, it, it's going to come to something else. I'll, I'll say towards the end. Uh, but what we what we did was take uh, a group of people with cluster and a group of controls, and you basically uh, sum the brains together, if you like, if you imagine averaging them, and then subtract them from each other. And on the on the uh, on your right, the yellow block is the, is the difference between effectively your brain, um, collectively speaking, and, uh, and and the rest of the community's uh, brain. You have a little bit more brain, um, if that's, uh, and that's pretty much documented. Uh, so you, you can take take that to the bank. But it doesn't actually seem to be a useful bit of brain, because <laughs> it causes you a lot of trouble. Um, and that's that anatomical observation gives us a bit of a bit of a hint. In this whole business, the problem is that when you start with the brain, you've got um, 10 to the power of 10 nerve cells in the cortex. Just a lot of cells. The whole brain's got, and the whole brain's got more cells than that. And what you're trying to do is like trying to uh, work out where the light globes are broken in a street in the US without even knowing the zip codes. It's quite a challenge. Even the satellites wouldn't be able to get there. So this imaging business has given us, but what it's done is told us which city the problem's in, um, which is a bit of a drag because metropolitan cities have lots of lights, but it's hellish better than looking over the whole country. Uh, and in, in our lifetime, probably 
the nature of that change will reveal itself if we get enough tissue to work with. I think that then that will be a next sort of step in understanding uh, the problem. Because understand one thing. Um, if there's one thing that I think we ought to do, I use we, I mean we, uh, is leave something behind. Okay, I'd be hopeless if all we manage to do with all the technology and stuff we've got is just like maybe it's good if we make some better treatments for your problems now. There's no doubt about that. It's something I'm about to talk about treatment. But the thing we really want to do is leave a legacy. Want to, you know, the disorder never got changed for hundreds and hundreds of years. But in our time, we have the opportunity to, you know, with knowledge, to actually change it in a way that was never changed before and leave it better than it ever was going to be. And that's a unique thing, I think. Next slide. Ah, try to talk about some of the treatment studies we've been involved in. Uh, next slide. The only way to convince um, regulatory bodies like the FDA or uh, a little bit less physician therapy, it depends on their attitude, but evidence is always best, and of course, insurance people, is to come with evidence, so called randomised controlled trials, um, where people get allocated to taking something active and something not active, and they get blinded to the two when you evaluate, um, evaluate the outcome. And uh, I think that we made some slow, but actually quite substantive progress in randomised controlled trial in, uh, in, in cost of headache in, in the last uh, half dozen years. But trying to do them a little bit out, a little bit in parallel or at one arm's length from industry, uh, as much as it's practical, um, one needs to collaborate with industry, it's a good thing. But one, I think that these sort of trials will be led by uh, sensible collaboration between themselves and uh, an academic fence. So we understand what we want and we go where we want to go. And the industry will come with us because actually they want things that work for you. That's what they want. Um, and governments and payers would like to see things, I think, driven by, uh, particularly by patient groups and Academia, rather, than like, it's not like this, not like industry steeple, but it's important that patients have a role in trials. So, this is a simple trial. It's intranasal uh, sumatriptan. It's the only placebo, randomised placebo controlled trial of that. It was a two attack study, um, placebo or uh, or uh, 20 milligrams of uh, intranasal sumatriptan, trade name Imitrex in this country, and it was done across five centres in Europe, and the result was quite clear and we published in the Journal of Neurology. And it, you can say in a medical meeting these days that there's evidence for the use of intranasal sumatriptan. People will not blanch and be happy to think that that's probably, uh, probably true. We couldn't have done this study without the involvement of all the people who went in the study. Because the important thing about these studies when we talk about them is the need for placebo. You don't convince people by having open-label studies where you know what you're getting. We only convince them with what are called placebo controlled trials, and we show some results from them. All the placebo controlled trials I've done are happily described to in the cluster headache patient groups and engage their uh, activity. IRBs, uh, ethics committees, will come back and say to me quite often, oh, it's unconscionable for you to ask these people to have a placebo. And I'll say to them, it's unconscionable of you not to take their problem seriously. That's what I say to them. But, uh, but we in academia need to 